Welcome everyone to the uh, second to last episode of this season of MIDI, uh, the MIDI Infrared Discussion Webinar Series. I'm uh, Simone Deliberato and together with uh, Vincenzo Giannini, I will be your host today. We are honored to have uh, with us uh, Professor Alexandra Boltaseva. She's uh, Ron and Dotti Garvin Tonis Professor of uh, Electrical and Computer Engineering at Purdue University. Alexandra is one of the world leading pioneers in the use of machine learning in photonics. She normally works with the slightly shorter wavelengths of what we are used to see here at MIDI, but I think the methods she has been developing can be easily extended to the MIDI infrared and they will be of great interest for our public. Some practical information before leaving the virtual floor uh, to Professor Boltaseva. The talk will last roughly 45 minutes, uh, followed uh, by question time. Uh, please note uh, this webinar will be recorded and eventually shared online, uh, including questions. Okay, please, Alexandra. Thank you so much, Simone and Vincenzo, for inviting me. Let me share my screen. And please let me know that everything is visible and everything looks good. Thank everything you. fine. Thank you. And I would like to thank you again for inviting. And I would like to thank everyone for joining. In fact, I just uh, looked at the list of participants and I saw some familiar, well, I almost said faces, but <laughs> names. And it uh, indeed feels great to stay connected during this um, unprecedented times. So highly appreciated. And I'm very happy to share with you some of the recent advancements that we made in applying machine learning uh, to photonic design and quantum measurements. It's interesting um, that you mentioned that our groups is one of the first ones using machine learning for different aspects of photonics. However, uh, my background for the last decade was in um, optical materials and fabrication of optical devices. So this is a very new area for us and we are learning and we are taking this baby steps in exploring this very interesting area that I do believe will help us to transform not only the area of um, photonic structures, but also have a tremendous impact on other uh, spectral regions, as you very rightfully mentioned. So I will start just with a couple of words of introduction where we are now in terms of um, optical uh, and emerging uh, technologies and how we envision machine learning or artificial intelligence at large can empower both photonics as well as other um, emerging technologies. I will use a few examples um, to share uh, what we're exploring right now. So I will share with you some advanced optimization of so-called plasmonic matter surfaces that we are utilizing uh, for concepts in efficient energy conversion, specifically thermophotovoltaics. I will speak about materials part. It has been my focus for many years, and I do believe that our knowledge of materials, our building blocks, is going to play a crucial role in merging AI with photonic technologies. And then I will also briefly mention about our efforts to apply machine learning for quantum photonic measurements and um, photonic design. Well, I don't have to convince anyone that optical technologies are very important and they have penetrated all areas of our life. Well, meet IR, terahertz, others are equally important, but as you mentioned, my focus is on shorter wavelengths. And um, I would like to remind you that all the um, um, IT communication systems, uh, many applications in energy conversion, uh, sustainable environment, digital economy, social media, and health are fueled by the development of optical technologies. And we're also the doorstep of the emerging quantum technology revolution. So with the speed of light, which is offered by photons and their ability to be exceptionally immune to decoherence because they interact weakly with matter, we are facing huge advances 
that are to be made in the areas of secure communication enabled by quantum uh, photonics, quantum optics, photonic quantum simulators, as well as quantum sensors based on quantum photonic systems. So if we look broadly at the ongoing industrial and information revolution, where we started um, with uh, um, the, the previous one, uh, where uh, computer and internet-based knowledge really transformed the society we live in, we are witnessing two concurrent revolutions right now. And these two revolutions are um, big data AI and quantum technology, which is going to be in the very heart of um, a number of extremely important uh, modern uh, science and technologies. So major breakthroughs in all technologies are very much also fueled by materials in order to enable devices, um, no matter how advanced your uh, design strategies are, you need materials, you need something um, that um, you can fabricate and um, send into the production uh, lines at the end. And let me remind you that in the um, optical frequency range, uh, scientists and engineers went from um, extremely large um, objects, microscopic objects, to mold the flow of light and to enable um, optical applications such as um, lenses and, and shades and all the elements of uh, geometrical optics to dimensions that were on the order of the wavelengths. And these are all these beautiful effects of diffraction interference, including um, the uh, very physics-rich field of photonic crystals. And um, we moved on and the whole field of um, optics um, is now residing in the area where the unit cells um, and the objects we are working with are much, much smaller than the wavelengths of light. And the whole area of so-called metamaterials um, um, actually falls into this uh, category, as well as quantum nanophotonics, where we are trying to manipulate uh, quantum um, objects. We are trying to engineer the properties of quantum emitters by coupling them with advanced um, metamaterials and plasmonic nanostructures specifically um, of a huge interest, which was also uh, technology driven in this area, um, is the field of so-called matter surfaces. So matter surfaces would be um, a, a single layer um, matter materials that are constructed of tiny uh, sub wavelength building blocks. And the beauty of, of, of matter surfaces is, is that they are almost planar technology. And that's why I said they're technology driven because you can have just a single layer of smartly designed material on top of your substrate um, that will lead to demonstration of ultra thin um, optical elements essentially with a potential of replacing um, the whole uh, uh, range of devices based on conventional lenses, conventional holograms. Um, and there has been um, myriads of beautiful works in this area with, with some of the groups um, listed here. I use an example of matter services here um, because um, one um, of the areas that um, we are looking into in renewable energy will be in applying matter services for efficient energy conversion. So the potential impact of these technologies is uh, really large, ranging not only from replacing uh, conventional bulky optics and enabling sub-wavelength optical um, circuitry, um, but also to applications in, in medical uh, diagnostics um, and, and treatment, nanofabrication, renewable energy, as well as emerging quantum information technology. So let's look at something that I call the photonics flowchart. Um, whether you're developing a structure to study some very fundamental effects um, in, in optics or whether you want a device like um, photovoltaic cell, you usually start with a concept, right? So you have something in mind that you want to realize. Um, when um, you know what you want, um, the next step is usually uh, to proceed with the design. So design step is something um, where you rely on the previous knowledge, on your intuition, 
but um, people have realized that you can also start to harness the power of machine learning and AI to give you some very unconventional design concepts and um, shapes. And I will um, talk about this um, today. People have also realized that um, machine learning in this um, photonic flow chart can play an important role on the um, integration part. So there are several groups um, that have been looking into very non-orthodox, unintuitive um, designs for integrated photonic circuitry to make it more efficient. Um, groups like uh, Helena Vukovic has actually achieved a great progress in realization of funny shaped but highly efficient photonic circuitry. Testing of optical devices um, is, can be empowered by machine learning, but it has not been applied to many areas thus far. We all know that it has been um, applied for the areas of uh, say image recognition uh, in decades, but not so much to the areas where you also want to recover a uh, useful signal from the sparse data. And I will use this example um, on uh, looking into um, quantum uh, measurements. What's less straightforward is um, how machine learning could uh, be merged with our understanding and knowledge of material databases that in fact are the ultimate enabler of practical devices. How do we take into account introduce building blocks, mat constituting materials into our networks to make sure machines will search not only geometrical shapes, but also the right materials for your device. Let's start with the design. So usually when you uh, do the design of optical um, components or any component to that matter, no matter which region, you start with numerical simulations. As I already said, usually this is some a priori knowledge, um, intuition-based, um, and quite often you end up with um, just varying the size of the structure. Let's say if it's a matter surface and you know uh, the um, people have demonstrated some interesting effects for cylindrical or for rod-like uh, unit cells, you can you know, play around with sizes, with spacing, and so on. Later, um, you can advance it to non-trivial designs and introduce machine learning. And I will go through the steps to demonstrate how it works. Well, you might think that simple shape variation is something very trivial, um, but in fact, it has been extremely powerful in the area of photonics, think photonic crystals. You'll get band gaps, you'll get forbidden um, um, gaps for light to propagate. And if you just change the size um, of your um, holes or rods, um, one of the interesting areas that um, falls into category of simple shape variation that I would like to mention today is also realizing matter surfaces to demonstrate so-called bound states in the continuum. And as I said, don't underestimate the power of simple shape variation because beautiful physics can indeed hide in very simple um, size change. So let me show you one example. And one example would be all dielectric matter surface that operates in this very peculiar bound state in the continuum regime. And as you can see, structure wise, it's extremely simple. You have a, um, a silicon dioxide substrate and dielectric spacer and you have titanium dioxide rods. Uh, so as simple as it can be. You can, from symmetry consideration and shapes, say that it should be polarization insensitive. And it turned out that by simple uh, variation of the shapes, what you can achieve is a point um, where um, essentially you will find yourself in this very dark uh, region. Uh, and this is uh, size um, of the cylinder wavelengths and your reflection. Essentially, you are exciting this um, dark uh, uh, mode that resides in the continuum. So this is, um, that has very interesting physics behind it. One simple way of uh, looking into that would be 
to imagine that you have two resonances that are coupled uh, to one radiation channel. And if they act as a perfect uh, reflectors net, their resonant point, they can form a standing wave in between so that nothing actually radiates in the outer space. So the great thing about the BIC regime is um, that um, uh, you can achieve extremely high Q factors and um, you can realize many applications um, that require um, extreme uh, light confinement and extreme narrow resonances such as for lasing, um, uh, sensing, and also enhanced uh, nonlinear radius. So this is just, um, again, a little more information on the structure that we have fabricated from the simple cylinders. So for the radius of 70 nanometers, you can see that it becomes extremely sensitive to the operational wavelengths. And um, you can find yourself in either one or um, the other uh, regime where your light is uh, largely confined to the cylinder. And if you move just um, ever so slightly, you will lose the confinement. And as I said, this can be used in a very simple geometry for achieving high um, uh, quality factor resonances in the visible range can easily be adjusted and um, can be used for application in lasing and enhanced nonlinear effects. So these are um, some of the uh, pioneering works, the very first ones in photonic BICs that I wanted to um, uh, show you. And again, uh, let us notice that these are very simple shapes. In most cases, simple shapes won't do. You want to do some more complex optimization to arrive with non-trivial shapes. I will use an example of uh, renewable energy conversion. Well, we all know that uh, single junction PV cells, they do um, have a fundamental limit. And um, obviously um, there would not be enough if you want to convert the whole um, solar spectrum into the uh, useful electrical signal. So um, what the first steps would be for efficient um, energy harvesting is to design um, a highly efficient broadband absorber. So you want to absorb as much of solar light as possible. And we have previously achieved some good results with um, matter surfaces. And again, you see uh, the simple designs here. And matter surface absorption is shown in red right here. And you can see a great overlap with the solar um, spectrum. Now, the next step um, after realizing this uh, broadband absorber would be actually to design an efficient emitter because you want to now emit this energy um, into the um, band, which coincide with a, a working band of the PV cell. Another very important thing to mention here is that in order to start even looking into energy applications, you need materials that will be refractory, which means high temperature stable. So that has been one of the problems in the area of metal-based nano-optics, um, plasmonics that uses gold and silver as main building blocks because they are soft and they um, do not have a high melting point. So we have been looking into so-called refractory ceramic materials such as uh, titanium nitrite. And these are matter surfaces that have been designed and made of titanium nitrite. So now when you move on to realize efficient energy conversion with so-called thermophotovoltaic concept, you want to combine your broadband absorber with a narrow band emitter, which would be engineered specifically for um, the uh, photovoltaic uh, selling need. So theoretically, it promises very high um, energy conversion, um, but um, you need uh, right high temperature stable materials. And um, you also are facing a multifaceted optimization problem. So you have to make sure that you um, develop the right material platform, you have the right design, you optimize everything, you can put everything together. Um, and in this multi-constrained problem, um, the optimization will also fall into highly um, hyperdimensional space. 
in order to attack um, one of the, uh, let's say, uh, unit cells in the TPV problem uh, connected to the um, efficient emitter, uh, we are designing the high temperature stable matter surface that will now be used as emitter to re-emit the radiation in the right spectral range. So we are using some well-known concept um, that has been proposed by several groups um, listed here um, at the bottom to use so-called um, gap plasma matter surfaces. In these structures, essentially you form um, a, a met metallic um, resonator um, on top of metal mirror and a dielectric spacer. So this configuration has proven to be um, very um, efficient um, in, um, in the specific applications. So just restating the problem of thermal photovoltaic challenges related to selective emitter. So if we um, look at the um, our emitter now. And, and by the way, your heat source does not have to be sun. So it can be anything. Just imagine that you either absorbed uh, radiation from sun or you have a burner. So now you just have a emitter uh, with a certain temperature with the, and you want to reshape the radiation which is emitted from this emitter. So, um, well, one thing is clear that the temperature of your emitter has to be high. So this is, um, and uh, uh, distribution of the emitted energy just for a black body. And obviously, um, if you want to work um, and be efficient and uh, shaded gray area is your working band of the photovoltaic cell, you want to move the peak of your um, emission into the working band of the PV cell. So for 1500 uh, Kelvin um, emission, what you have to target as your, um, opti in your optimization is to maximize the um, amount of radiation uh, which is emitted in this spectral region. And then uh, essentially um, you, you have to suppress the radiation out of the band because it leads to unwanted heating. People have looked at this um, um, before and people have suggested various types of matter surfaces for such um, matter surface thermal emitters. But you see that we again start with simple shapes. So what can we do here? So what can we do? We can start, um, and this is what we also started with, uh, with a simple uh, design of having a metallic mirror. In this case, it's titanium nitride. Remember, it's high temperature stable. Silicon nitride dielectric and then titanium nitride disc on top. Now you can use um, some of the standard optimization techniques like particle swarm optimization. But um, even the, this optimization will not um, uh, give you much variance or much improvement in your in-band emission because you don't have enough degrees of freedom. To tackle this, you need uh, more advanced optimization approaches. And we've chosen so-called topology optimization that actually came into this area from the area of mechanical engineering, where it, it, it has been used for ages for optimizing the material distribution for complex problems um, in, um, for example, in air uh, designing airplanes and um, bridges. So largely pioneered by um, Eli Yablonovich, Ole Sigmund, um, it has been very successfully applied for a range of problems in photonic crystals, uh, integrated uh, waveguides designed, meta surfaces, and even topological photonics. Uh, Shanwei Fan, um, Helena Vukovic, and many others listed here has done a tremendous progress in this area. So um, what we are doing in topology optimization, we start with a structure shown here. Again, we have a metallic mirror. We have um, a spacer that you assign thickness to. And you have your optimization region, um, which is uh, just 120 nanometer thick titanium nitride air mixture. So you start with the initial random distribution. And, um, um, and after that, um, you have to um, actually set some limitations on, um, on this design. So you are perturb your design. So you're using forward and uh, join um, FDTD simulations over all spectrum. 
And um, uh, one important thing uh, in the whole topology optimization process um, that um, you can find in all the Zygmunt's work, um, the detailed description, would be to impose uh, some constraints, because this is what is important in, uh, in order to enable uh, practical devices or practical designs. So the constraints here would be that your design is stable over perturbations. So obviously small changes in the shapes should not give you a tremendous change in efficiency. And the second one is um, that you have to impose some limitations on how uh, big or small the structures are. So they're actually practically uh, uh, possible to fabricate. So topology optimization is uh, great. Um, and um, you see that um, you arrive to some very non-trivial uh, distribution of material in the top layer. So just to show you the um, topology optimization where you start with continuous material distribution and then you arrive to the binary air titanium ni uh, nitrate mixture that you actually will need um, for um, making sure that it's compatible with uh, fabrication. <clears throat> so if you compare with um, cylindrical design, the red curve of the emission, you see that topology optimization give you something which, is, which becomes flatter and that's exactly what you want um, for being more efficient in energy conversion. Maximum effic efficiency here compared to ideal one would be 92%. It's great but it is very time consuming. It is still a local maximum search. So um, most likely you will not end up uh, finding uh, your global maximum. But the most important thing is that there is no hyperdimensionality. If you ever want to include different materials, different architecture, it will be computationally um, impossible or close to impossible. So here where machine learning can really help us. Machine learning has been applied in the areas of photonics already by many groups, and it's just skyrocketing right now. There are tons of groups doing wonderful research um, in this area. Um, largely, we can say that we can divide um, uh, the uh, research directions here into uh, deep neural network based and generative networks for design optimization. We started with applying so-called generative adversarial network to generate highly efficient design for our meta surface called GAN. Here is an idea. As I said, in direct topology optimization, you start with a random distribution. And then your um, optimization uh, process leads you most likely to a local extremum. Now, what you want to do with GAN, you want to train your network on already optimized designs such that your training set consists of local maxima. So this would be locally optimized design that gives you high efficiency. The idea is that GAN can learn how this maxima look like and help you to converge to the global one. So GAN um, works in the following way. You have a training set and you have, um, a, and what you want is generate designs from the random noise that will outperform your original training set, but would be similar to the training set. So generator generates design from random noise. Discriminator tries to, um, uh, determine whether it's real or fake. So they are in constant competition and that's how the training of the network is performed. So that's what we hope for. We hope to gain speed because you don't have to do it in hand with direct optimization. We want to have access to global maximum and we also want to have access to the ability to expand the parameter space. Let me show you our results for um, GAN for design production. We have generated as a starting point for the training set 200 designs and it took about 50 hours. So it's very long. Now, um, 200 designs is not enough to train um, any of the neural networks or again. So you have to expand it. So you can use some different tricks 
to do that, um, do some rotations and uh, symmetry translations. And um, we have used about 8,000 designs as the training set. What's great about it is that the first time you run your GAN, and GAN, uh, and, and, and GAN actually uh, delivers around 1,000 design in less than one minute. You see they're pretty similar to the training set with high efficiencies. Then you can apply few iteration of direct optimization to this design and just make them even better and feed them back to the system to train it even more. We have also explored some other machine learning approaches such as variational order encoder. What is um, great about um, autoencoders is that um, they are not trying to search the whole parameter space in this very complex geometrical shapes. They are actually compressing um, the main features of the training patterns into so-called uh, Latin space, like a very compact representation. And then the decoder is learning to read um, the state from the compact representation and reconstruct it. The great thing about it is that um, you can do some engineering and some tricks in this space. And again, you're not here dealing with uh, uh, this direct uh, complete geometrical shapes. You're using with a, a compressed representation. So it's simpler and, and you can impose some uh, different constraints on your Latin space. And, um, um, and, and that's what you can do in more advanced version of autoencoders. So it's adversarial autoencoder. And um, that um, in fact um, allows you to do some um, sort of engineering of the Latin space and um, um, give you access to even uh, more um, variations in uh, possible parameters. So let's look at what those um, autoencoders um, can provide. So you generate different designs um, by um, the uh, system. You refine them with just a few of iteration of uh, topology optimization. And if you compare it with direct topology optimization, um, this approach will actually enable um, to reach almost 98% uh, of total efficiency. So indeed, uh, machine learning does allow you to um, enhance the efficiency. It allows you to uh, dramatically speed up uh, the process. Um, and it will later also allow you to introduce more, uh, uh, to expand the parameter space. As I already mentioned, for example, if you want to, to look for um, more efficient designs in different architecture, like different thicknesses or even multi-layers, and you also would be able to introduce material component into that. Now we come to materials, which as I said, is extremely important factor in designing uh, devices, no matter which part of the spectrum you're operating with. Materials can give us access to yet another um, tailorable parameter for your AI, right? So you can say that if you're dealing with tailorable or adjustable materials, your dielectric permittivity epsilon will just be yet another parameter that machine will be optimizing over. Materials um, will also give you to uh, dynamically tunable materials. You can tailor them for applications in, in um, nonlinear optics or high energy application, but they can also lead to totally different optical phenomena and new physics. Materials such as refractive index near zero or um, ultra thin, atomically thin transdimensional materials that I will also mention today. Again, I wanna stress here that Materials is, is a really um, in our basis, right? So it both enables practical devices, but also opens the door to um, fundamentally a new uh, phenomena. And right now um, in, um, in optics, we do have access to all kinds of materials. You can have your dielectric permittivity positive with dielectrics. You can work with metallic materials, with metals and semi-metals. You can even reside in the area where your uh, dielectric permittivity is close to zero or refractive index is extremely, extremely low. 
As I already said, having a material that has a tailorable optical response is extremely important because you can fit it uh, or use it as a parameter in your uh, machine learning approach. And uh, one great thing about uh, uh, plasmonic ceramic material that we have been working with for our Metasurface applications um, is that they are um, tailorable. So if you compare with conventional plasmonic materials like gold and silver, um, transition metal nitrides can be made uh, more or less metallic, um, and they can also be grown epitaxially in a range of um, substrates. Um, another great class of materials um, in optical range for um, a lot of applications, um, but um, is uh, so-called um, epsilon E0 material, as I will just said. Uh, transparent conducting oxides, such as well-known indium tin oxide, ITO, is a great um, representative of this class. Um, so your dialectic permittivity for this materials crosses zero in the near IR range. And then they also have um, very low imaginary part of material laws, which means that their refractive index would be extremely low. And it has actually powered entirely new area of optics very recently. You have to rewrite the very fundamental of nonlinear optics, or you can call it single optics, where the linear part of the refractive index is extremely low. And these materials are also tailorable. So that would be um, yet another great addition to optical material database. Um, one um, direction um, which I feel is also important both for fundamental effects and emerging applications um, is um, what we call transdimensional um, plasmonic materials. So transdimensional because they exhibit properties um, somewhere in between 2D and, and, and 3D. So, um, and by 3D, we mean conventional thin films. So you can think about um, two-dimensional material, right, graphene, um, but uh, make maybe five or 10 layers of that. If you will be working with materials, conventional materials that are just several atomic layers thin, you will actually suddenly find yourself in a completely different regime of operation you will suddenly have strongly enhanced nonlinearities, you will have quantum effects and extraordinary tunability um, by both optical and um, electrical excitation. So it has been predicted by Javier Garcia de Abaja in 2014 that if you make a gold um, a particle from spherical to like a monolayer disc, you will see um, the change in the spectral response of the surface uh, plasma resonance depending on uh, electrical biasing. Marin Soliaci's group predicted that you will have access to unique light matter interactions in this highly confined regime. But what's again relevant to what we are talking about is that this regime opens the door to high tolerability. Okay, I want to adjust my optical response but my material is not tailorable or not tunable. Well, if you go to several atomic um, layers of this material, you will actually gain the control over the optical properties. We are just uh, changing the thickness of your material or by adjusting strain or stress. And this is something that we have known from the area of semiconductors for ages. It has just not been applied for materials in, in, in nanophotonics, such as um, metallic or plasmatic materials. So it's a, um, an extremely interesting range um, that can feed uh, both into um, fundamental signs of extreme uh, light matter interactions um, with enhanced nonlinearities, um, enabling indirect uh, transition excitations or even forbidden transitions, but also access to tailorable or um, uh, optical properties. So for example, for the material um, that I already introduced for titanium nitride, if you go to uh, from a single layer to 10 atomic layers, that's would about uh, two nanometers. And this is something that we can do. And we, in fact, we fabricated, you will see that um, your the level of metallicity, or in other words, your plasma frequency shift with uh, um, shifting uh, thickness. So these are just a couple of examples of how materials can be tailored. 
And um, it is my belief that um, our optimization process, um, which is empowered by machine learning, is to be coupled with tailorable material platforms so that, again, your optimization space is not only shapes and thicknesses and architectures, but also constituent materials. So let's move on. And I have a couple of more points that I wanted to make. Um, when we uh, go to testing of devices, as I said, in image reconstruction uh, from the sparse data, there has been tremendous advances on using AI to um, um, actually uh, reconstruct um, images. Um, and um, um, what um, has not been ex explored uh, that much is how to apply similar approaches to reconstruct some data from, uh, from sparse measurements in the areas of optics and quantum photonics. So um, I will not uh, be talking about much about the integrated quantum nanophotonics, but um, as I mentioned in the very beginning, uh, this is an ongoing technology revolution. And, and at Purdue, we have a great effort, which is directed towards uh, enabling of uh, different aspects or different elements of, of, of the future hybrid integrated quantum nanophotonic platforms. And in these um, platforms, essentially what you want to combine the advantages and, and, and leverage uh, the advancement in um, nanoplasmonics, um, integrated um, optics, um, electronics uh, to achieve high performance. So for that, we would need to integrate dissimilar materials, um, quantum emitters, and novel structures for enhancing light matter interactions and engineering uh, the quantum response. Um, one work, uh, recent work, and this is um, led by um, uh, my colleague um, uh, and, and dear husband of Lush Life at Purdue. And in fact, um, we, we do have lots of projects that we're uh, doing together. This project is on uh, coupling of um, quantum emitters and specifically at nitrogen vacancy centers uh, in nanodiamonds um, in, with uh, plasmonic cavities um, to uh, move towards bright room temperature single photon sources. So so in, um, in this configuration, so when, uh, since we know that plasmonics really uh, promotes um, and, and enhances line matter interactions, um, you can um, actually engineer the radiation from such a quantum emitter and uh, you get tremendous lifetime shortening and um, emit photons um, with uh, tremendous uh, uh, speed. The challenge um, of quantum photonics um, is related to a choice of quantum emitters. So in order to realize a circuitry or a single photon source, um, you need to find the proper quantum emitters. So you need to have the proper material system. And you also want to know whether your um, quantum emitter is of quantum purity, right? Is it a single photon emitter or is it a source of multiple photons? Long characterization time is really playing the field of quantum photonics. So you really have to, uh, you know, find using a microscope and using fluorescence, you have to find the emitter and you have to uh, spend a long time uh, characterizing it. Um, and for uh, usually for characterization of um, quantum emitters using so-called uh, measurements of G2 function. It's a second order autocorrelation function. Um, and you need, um, well, sometimes, you know, 10 and, and even 20 uh, minutes in order to retrieve the complete uh, data set. So machine learning application to sparse data in this case would really open many doors. Let me mention here that um, there is somewhat related work uh, on applying machine learning for speeding up uh, measurements of semiconductor quantum devices uh, led by Oxford group of uh, Natalia Arias. Um, and um, again, here, what we are doing is we are applying machine learning for rapid classification and detection of quantum emitters and in this case, it, I mean, it can be just a quantum emitter, uh, like a, a defect center in solids. It can also be defect in 2D materials, which uh, means that you can use it 
in the future for um, quantum uh, materials metrology. So what you're doing instead of measuring each emitter for a long time, you are measuring, um, um, you're first uh, uh, creating um, a, a sparse training data set. You're measuring good and bad emitters for very short time, label them and then train your classifier such that your classifier can with high fidelity tell you whether your emitter is good or bad based on sparse data. So uh, classifiers are trained via error back propagation using stochastic gradient descent optimization. And it allows you again to distinguish very fast between uh, good and bad emitters. And the very last um, couple of minutes, um, I'm gonna spend on um, integration. So we talked about design, materials, measurements, and uh, the last step is actually to move towards uh, fabricating and integrating your device into hybrid systems. And that's again, where we have to leverage on recent advances, both in integrated photonics, in machine learning for integrated photonics, and our recent knowledge about emerging um, quantum um, on-chip uh, photonics. Let me show you this example first um, of um, some optimized integrated um, on-chip structures by Helena Vukovic. So this is an example of a highly non-trivial inverse designed uh, diamond photonics that um, provides you with much higher efficiency uh, compared to the structures that you have uh, you could design by hand. Now applying similar approach of inverse design now empowered by machine learning, um, you should be um, optimizing and generating designs of how most efficiently combine or couple your emitter with uh, maybe photonic or plasmonic cavity and how to outcouple light uh, to the on-chip circuitry. So for this, uh, similar approaches uh, can be used, um, AEE design, for example, and again, this would uh, lead to highly non-trivial or unintuitive designs of um, your hybrid circuitry. So we do envision that machine learning will have a great impact on the area of hybrid circuitry. So it can um, speed up uh, measurements as we already shown. It will be used for quantum device um, optimization as well as um, in future for deterministic assembly and also rapid prototyping of quantum devices. Because as I mentioned in the beginning of this part, uh, it will be a platform of highly dissimilar systems. So you will have to integrate uh, different waveguides with maybe resonators of different materials. Um, you will deal with um, different quantum emitters, whether it's a, a solid uh, defects and solids, or maybe it's even integration of a 2D material together. So you will need very powerful approach, approaches um, by uh, combining machine learning with maybe atomic force microscopy for assembly and prototyping of quantum devices. So to the end, let me bring this um, AI aided photonics chart here again. We talked about some examples of how AI can be used at each step of this photonic process. And I do believe that at the end, AI will also help us to discover new physics. With that, I would like to thank um, our extended photonics team at Purdue. So mostly my collaboration with uh, professors Vlad Chalayev and Alex Kildyshev. And um, machine learning part um, is powered and driven by our stellar postdoc, uh, Jacques Salakidishev. With that, I thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Alexandra, for the very interesting talk. For, for being just moving baby steps, you are moving a lot of them, I have to say, uh, in all directions. Uh, we have now time for, uh, for questions. If you have questions, 
you can uh, either just write the question in the chat and I will read it or write voice in the chat. I will unmute you and you will be able to ask the question. I have first uh, a few questions to ask. Uh, first question. Uh, you showed uh, and that you think that you are looking into uh, exploiting machine learning uh, uh, to explore the uh, transition between bulk, multi-layer and uh, uh, 2D physics. And, and just at the end, you said that uh, you think machine learning will bring us toward the discovery of new physics. Can you say a few more personal, personal words about where the boundary lies? Because uh, how much do you, of the new physics do you need to put inside the, the machine uh, to actually get some new physics, uh, physics out of it? Because yeah. of course, uh, if, I, if I put a bulk epsilon, a bulk the, the electric functions, there is no way that my machine learning will give me uh, two dimensional physics. Where, where the boundary lies? This is a very, very interesting question. And um, frankly, I, right now I will not be able to say where the boundary is, but what I know for sure is that we have to team up with computer scientists who are developing this machine learning algorithm. So what I've shown are just such baby steps where we take conventional algorithms that are already out there for a completely different set of problems. And we try to apply them for photonics or slightly adjust and apply them for photonics. Now, the future is in so-called physics informed algorithms, right? So you have to introduce some knowledge about the underlying physics of your system inside the algorithm so that ultimately you don't have to like supervise your system too much because all we are doing is like supervised learning, right? You give them the training set of what you know and then ask the machine to find something which is more efficient. But many of these algorithms are in fact limited by the training set. So you want the machine to make uh, sure it looks outside. So we're interested in outsiders. But in order to do that, again, you have to um, introduce some, um, some features of the physics involved, right? If you're looking like at the resonances, uh, is there is any correlation between the modes and, and geometrical features and things like that? Um, so that machine can, um, can be unsupervised and, and find the correlations that you have not seen yourself. Um, whether it will be able ever to go from 3D to 2D on its own, I don't know. <laughs> but what, yeah, but what I know is that, um, again, by introducing um, this physics or developing novel physics driven algorithms and making sure that um, we, we give access to multiple parameter space, we might see some very interesting features. For example, I know that in, um, in inverse design and in other approaches, um, intentionally you, you had to cut out some areas of being non-physical, like, you know, epsilon of zero, right? Now you don't, I mean, you shouldn't cut it because these are real materials. So they can be, things like that, that you thought unphysical and you cut them out, but the algorithm actually looked at those and gave it back to you. Yeah. But uh, it's a long road. It's a long road. We have to develop it together with people developing algorithms. Yeah, because what, one, one of the first things you, you showed, one of the first results you showed was about uh, the bound state in the continuum. And there you have very narrow resonances. So uh, in order to, you, you really need to know that even though it's just a standard optics, Maxwell equations, standard console sees them, but in order to know they are there, you have need to already have found them because they are very, being, uh, they are very sharp in parameter space. So yes. uh, is this, uh, anyway, I, I think you have, you have a, a 
already yeah. the answer to this. Right? We, we don't know, yeah. but we are trying to get there anyway. Uh, I have other questions, but uh, before I, like, we already have a few questions for the public, so I will, uh, I will ask the question for the public. The one from uh, Wasim Ahmed, um, how did you decide which machine learning algorithms uh, you wanted to try use? Is there a good review of such techniques uh, which compares the use cases and performance for each type? Um, well, to start with, and you just look what's available. As I said, we are not writing our own algorithms. So um, there are like resources online where you can even, you know, go and, and try to run your, your GAN or AE or VEA. Um, we started just by trying out and then looking at which performs better. That was the same for um, metasurface design and for the uh, classifiers and just see which one gives the high efficiency or higher fidelity. Now, um, there, there are some reviewers uh, to uh, look at. And by the way, um, there is a review in Nature Photonics um, on machine learning specifically for uh, photonic applications. So um, it's uh, uh, Youngmin uh, Lu and Wenchan Tsai, uh, myself and uh, Jacques Selig, um, who is leading that in, in the group. Um, so we have tried to outline some of the um, algorithms and uh, what the difference between them um, are. Um, let me also comment, um, for example, um, what you should take into account. For example, GAN is great and it's very fast in designing, uh, in coming up with uh, efficient designs. But GAN is also known to be more limited by the training set. Remember what I just said, you want to find outliers, right? Something which is different from the training set because training sets you generated yourself. You sort of know that. Um, so autoencoders would be, let's say better than GAN in this regard. So they will have a higher chance to give you an outlier than the GAN system. So there are things like that that you have to look at and compare and see what would be best for your specific case. Um, but again, I refer to Nature Photonics Review. Just uh, look at it um, and, you know, stay alert. Things are happening very, all, uh, very fast in this field. It's just taking off. Uh, then we have two questions from Nathan Shamma. Uh, does your group maintain an open source repository with custom tools uh, or have you considered doing so? The machine learning ecosystem is heavily reliant on the open source stack, Shikit Learn, TensorFlow, PyTorch, etc. It would be great to spur activity in this direction in the metamaterial slash quantum photonics community, possibly focusing on the interesting interface of lab controllers slash data acquisition, etc. Are you building up uh, completely new tools for discovery for each paper or developing more integrated slash extensible tools? Mm -hmm. um, so the first question, um, absolutely great idea. And I think that this is something that should be done. We have not been uh, looking into that. We like, we were, we were too focusing on like get the first result out. And, um, but I know that group of uh, Professor Wen Shan Tsai, who is a course on this uh, Nature Botanics Review, um, I believe that they put that out there. So it's available. You can go there and apply GAN to a matter surface and, you know, tailor the spectral response and things like that. So it, it's happening. Um, it's still a long way. We will have to arrive to open source. And moreover, I do believe that in future, we will have to integrate it with the uh, material uh, database for all the optical materials we know. Because, uh, I mean, that's the only way, right? Not only the design, but also the material building blocks. So um, um, we'll get there, but it, it will require some, some effort. Now for us, um, as I said, um, we started with, uh, yeah, uh, commercially or, uh, online available tools, um, but we do um, adjust them for our uh, problems. Um, 
if you um, so if you think about um, uh, different algorithms that I mentioned, um, specifically um, autoencoders, uh, where you can um, impose some restriction on the uh, on the Latin space. And um, uh, depending on you know distribution of parameters, and so you can you you will definitely uh, be able to adjust the algorithm for um, your specific problem. Now, for the whole process of applying machine learning to um, a set of problems, um, obviously you have to know what kind of system you are considering and the physics involved. To give an example for the um, uh, classification problem for the uh, sparse data and quantum measurements, um, you actually have to build a model um, to, um, of a three level system for the quantum emitter and to generate enough of the data to train the system. So in a way indirectly maybe, but it's still physics involved into the whole process because you need it to generate and refine the uh, training set and then um, apply your algorithm. So Jacques Salik right now is working on modifying some of the algorithms so that they can be directly applicable to, let's say, meta surface or um, uh, quantum problems. But we are not per se developing algorithms themselves. Uh, second question Have you seen or participated to any work using machine learning to enable some aspect of a super radiance experiment, possibly in conjunction with a, mater a metamaterial design? meaning by super radiance also non-quantum effects uh, as long as the length scale is uh, much smaller than the wavelength. Um, so we have not looked at this um, the, so far, but um, it's definitely been on the list, um, on list to do, not specifically related to machine learning, but this is just uh, you know, a combination of uh, quantum emitters um, especially uh, with new concepts in both metamaterials and this um, epsilon near zero index media are very interesting. So and and so that's definitely something that um, uh, we we will be looking into, but we have not started that yet. Uh, I have a second question. Can you show again the slide in which you show the application uh, uh, on? Uh, quantum measurements. You have uh, a plot in which you say that you train a neural network using the G2 measurements. Yeah, this one. Uh, what are the actual parameters? And more generally, how much the, par the kind of parameterization of uh, the data, uh, mm. because I mean, in, in some kind of data, if you are in you have uh, speed, uh, you have position, yeah, yeah. Fine. Mm -hmm. in physics, uh, you are, we are used uh, to have a more fluid situation in which uh, we can do a Fourier transform to do a, a, a very trivial thing. There are, we, we know that there are uh, uh, ways of represent data which make uh, the solution look to a human much more clear. So question one, which data you use here? Second question, how much this representation uh, a representation question uh, is uh, relevant uh, for uh, training uh, machine uh, for machine learning. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so let me actually start maybe with the second one. <clears throat> so one of the things is you're right. So you have a, like a physical problem, and then you want to see uh, whether it falls into a specific category that can be solved by machine learning. In many cases. Um, this, um, what is related to quantum measurements uh, experiment, uh, whether it's a single or multi photon emission identification, falls into so called uh, uh, classification problems. So it's either binary classification, good, bad, white, black, whatever, you name it, and it would be very generic, right? So it's um, either binary uh, classification or maybe it's a uh, um, uh, multiple classification, not only in uh, binary. Okay. So um, this is what you have to establish uh, first. So classification is one. Now your problem can also fall into uh, like regression models. Um, for like 
th this would be relevant for, let's say, super resolution imaging or where you have like microscopy and you have to um, define where your emitter is um, based on very um, unfocused data and the regression. And then you, the machine will tell you, you know, how to move your AFM tip or how to focus. And so, and, and this would be, uh, so regression based and, and, and classification or classifiers would be like two immediate sets of problems that, um, that can be solved or sped up by machine learning. Now, uh, back to the first part, when we talk about uh, specifically quantum emission classification, um, what you are um, measuring and what your parameter will be, the ones that actually tells you good or bad, uh, would be the value of G2 at uh, uh, zero delay. So G2 at zero delay, um, if it's above one half, we say it's a bad emitter. If it's below one half, then it's uh, so the, the the detectors won't click together. So it means that it's a high probability of a single emitter. Yeah. So um, the other so G two is essentially uh, the parameter that you're looking into, but the output is G two G two at zero delay. Um, and another parameter is uh, something that is related to you know how uh, many counts you have in each bean, which is essentially another way of uh, introducing your intensity, which is also important. And there is a certain, you will see later um, that there is a certain correlation between like intensity and the purity of the emission, because obviously if it's a single photon emission, they will be more dim. So they, the intensity would be uh, lower. So these are like two parameters. So you have a like intensity level and you have the G2 at um, zero delay, um, which, is, um, which is your output. Okay, we have other two questions from the public. Uh, one from uh, Ming Zhe. Thank you for the great talk uh, for the uh, Past data classification task in quantum emitter. How do you get the test slash train data? Do you downsample a set of good and bad quantum emitter data? So usually what you do, and and you have um, like we have this NV centers in nano diamond. So you have a substrate with like bunch of them. Um, so first you have to um, measure uh, them in our conventional way, right? Because uh, I mean, you, you have to train the system. So you measure some emitters for a long time so that you know 100% that they are good or bad, right? So you actually measure the G2 and you did the conventional uh, fit, which is shown right here. So with a complete data set, you did the fit and you retrieve the label, good or bad. And then, then you do the sparse measurements on the emitters that you already know. And then you're using this as, um, as a training for, for your system. So that's, that's, that's how it is. But you do have to um, actually spend some time and measure actual emitters. Um, now you also, uh, develop, as I, as I said, you also develop um, a model. So you need also physical um, parameters of the system like lifetimes and, and then so that you can actually um, do this uh, numerical as well. Uh, we have another question from Andrea Sessler. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, in your opinion, should one revisit the concept of 3D uh, metamaterials again now with the advanced tools uh, for design like machine learning and nanofabrication? I would definitely say, of course. Um, and um, with the recent development is like in 2D and especially in this uh, um, trans-dimensional field, um, there are just so many question and so many unexplored things down there. Um, what's um, very exciting is, um, again, exploration of quantum effects. Um, 
extremely enhanced uh, nonlinear behavior um, and um, also just uh, this um, high degree tunability, high degree uh, response uh, to any uh, external stimuli. Is there any further question? Well, if not, I think uh, we can all thank uh, Professor Boltasev again for her uh, very interesting talk, uh, which spurred quite a lot of, uh, of questions. And uh, I talk to you all for your attention and uh, I hope to have you with us again next week for the last episode of the season with uh, Professor Paolo Biagioni who will discuss uh, uh, mid-infrared plasmonics uh, in doped uh, semiconductors. Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you, everyone. See you next week. Thank you all. <laughs>